Did you hear the one about the famous violinist who played in a subway station and no one noticed? Well, it was a different story today, and Jeffrey Brown was there. Ever pondered how societal norms and biases shape the perceived value and appreciation of art? Well, the Joshua Bell subway experiment is a compelling testament to this phenomenon. Picture this. January 12, 2007, a bustling subway station in Washington, D.C., during the morning rush hour. Amidst the hustle and bustle, a virtuoso violinist, Joshua Bell, takes up his bow. He's armed with a Stradivarius violin, an instrument valued at three and a half million dollars. Bell is no ordinary musician. He's a globally acclaimed artist, renowned for his extraordinary talent. On this particular day, however, he's incognito, blending in with the crowd, his identity concealed. He fills the station with the exquisite beauty of Bach's intricate compositions, creating a mesmerizing melody that echoes off the subway walls. Yet remarkably, amidst the symphony that Bell orchestrates, commuters pass by without a second glance. The enchanting melodies that usually captivate concert halls are drowned out by the mundane sounds of the subway. Even as children pause, drawn to the music, their parents usher them away, oblivious to the extraordinary spectacle unfolding before them. One might assume that such a performance by a musician of Bell's caliber would halt commuters in their tracks. But the reality paints a starkly different picture. Over a thousand people passed by Bell that morning, yet only seven paused to listen, and merely twenty tossed coins into his open violin case. Bell, a musician whose concerts are usually met with standing ovations and sold-out venues, found himself playing to an indifferent audience. The same music that, in a different setting, would be met with applause and admiration, largely fell on deaf ears. And so, Bell's music, usually met with standing ovations, was largely ignored in the subway station. The very same melodies that have captivated audiences worldwide were lost in the cacophony of the morning commute. This raises intriguing questions about the perception and appreciation of art in our society, which we will delve into in the upcoming segments. Let's dissect this phenomenon through the lens of psychological theories. One such theory is the social perception theory, which suggests that we interpret and evaluate stimuli based on social context and expectations. Now consider the context of the subway station during rush hour. It's a hub of utilitarian tasks where commuters are focused on getting to their destinations. The unexpected presence of a world-class musician disrupts this context, causing a cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, a term coined by psychologist Leon Festinger, refers to the mental discomfort experienced when confronted with new information that contradicts existing beliefs or values. In this scenario, Bell's virtuoso performance clashes with commuters' preconceptions of subway buskers, creating a dissonance that is resolved by dismissing the performance as inconsequential. This dismissal is a manifestation of perceptual neglect, a fascinating psychological phenomenon where individuals fail to notice an unexpected yet fully visible event or object because their attention is engaged elsewhere. In the case of Joshua Bell's subway performance, the commuter's attention was so consumed by their routine tasks that they overlooked the extraordinary spectacle unfolding before them. But there's another element at play here, a concept known as the bystander effect. This psychological phenomenon suggests that individuals are less likely to take action or show interest in an event when other people are present. The logic behind this is that individuals assume that someone else will take action. So, in a bustling subway station filled with indifferent passers-by, individuals were less likely to stop and appreciate Bell's performance, assuming that if it were truly noteworthy, others would have already taken notice. Part of the reason why I accepted to come here at the invitation of the Union Station is that they said this time we're going to ask, tell people about it, yeah. spread the word, and, and, and hopefully you'll get a, a captive audience. And I said, you know, this is precisely what the whole original experiment, which was not a scientific in any way, uh, that's really what it was about. What about the idea, and I, I was thinking of this as, as they started clapping after the first movement. Sometimes there's this discussion in classical oh, music yeah. circles you know, should we encourage people to clap? Should it be a less formal experience? Well, first of all, people, if you go back 100 years or 200 years when the music of Mendelssohn was being performed, 
people did clap yeah. uh, after the uh, first movement. You know, when when ba when Beethoven's Seventh Symphony was premiered after the second movement, they clapped so much that they had to repeat the second movement and mm -hmm. do it again. I yeah. mean, so there was a different kind of vibe. And so when people today say you're not supposed to clap, I actually say you know it's historically it's actually inc incorrect. And and uh, I enjoy uh, I enjoy when I hear people clapping at the wrong times. I think that's great. We got a listener that's not used to going to. We got a new listener, and that just that excites me. Yeah, but you don't want to discourage that, right? So do you, I do don't. You, I've had conductors playing with conductors that turn around to the audience and say, "Don't, don't clap," you know, and and, and then I'll, I'll usually turn to the audience and say, "Come on, do it." I <laughs> We often to wrap it up. The subway station's context disrupted the typical cognitive schema. The commuter's focus on utilitarian tasks, coupled with the bystander effect, led to cognitive dissonance and perceptual neglect. This resulted in an intriguing case of perceptual neglect, where a virtuoso musician played to an audience too caught up in their own worlds to notice. Sociological theories also shed light on this unusual public response. Let's delve into the bystander effect, a sociological phenomenon that might have played a role in the general lack of engagement during Bell's subway performance. The bystander effect refers to the paradoxical situation where, despite being in a crowded area, individuals are less likely to take action or show interest in an event, assuming that others will take the lead. In the case of our subway concert, the constant stream of passers-by, each wrapped in their own rush hour thoughts, may have created a collective inertia, discouraging any single person from stopping to appreciate the music. But let's go a step further. Consider the concept of cultural capital and symbolic elitism. Cultural capital refers to the accumulation of knowledge, behaviours and skills that one can use to demonstrate one's cultural competence and thereby impress others. Symbolic elitism, on the other hand, is the tendency of individuals to engage in activities or appreciate forms of art that are perceived as high status or elite. Now imagine the hurried commuter whose cultural capital might not include a deep understanding of classical music, or who does not perceive the subway as a suitable context for a high-status activity like a violin concert. This person might fail to recognize the value of Bell's performance, not because they cannot appreciate the beauty of the music, but because their sociological programming does not associate this context with this form of art. In essence, the bystander effect might have created a field of indifference, while cultural capital and symbolic elitism might have shaped the lens through which that field was viewed. The result? A virtuoso musician playing to an audience conditioned to disregard his performance. Symbolic elitism and the bystander effect combined led to a profound disregard for Bell's virtuoso performance. Now let's examine how these phenomena contribute to a larger societal issue, perceptual elitism. The overarching phenomenon at play here can be termed as perceptual elitism. This is where the appreciation of art becomes intertwined with our social constructs and biases, often diluting the pure essence of artistic enjoyment. The term perceptual elitism encapsulates the idea that societal norms and biases often dictate the perceived value and appreciation of art. Let's consider the Joshua Bell subway experiment. The music was, by all accounts, extraordinary. But in the context of a bustling subway station during rush hour, it was perceived as nothing more than background noise. Why? Because the setting did not align with the societal norms associated with such high-caliber performance, the subway station was not an opera house nor a concert venue. It was a place of transit, not art. Perceptual elitism also suggests the role of societal biases in shaping our appreciation of art. For instance, we tend to assign higher value to art forms that are associated with higher social status, often neglecting the beauty of more accessible forms of art. This means that art appreciation becomes less about the art itself and more about what it represents in the social hierarchy. This is where the concept of cultural capital comes into play. Cultural capital refers to the set of cultural knowledge, skills, education and other cultural goods that are valued by a society. In many societies, a high level of cultural capital is associated with higher social status. Consequently, individuals may engage in the consumption of high-status art forms, not out of genuine appreciation, 
but as a means to signal their social standing. This leads to a superficial understanding and appreciation of art, where the focus shifts from the intrinsic beauty of the art to its extrinsic societal value. The art is no longer appreciated for what it is, but rather for what it signifies in the societal context. Art, in this scenario, becomes less about genuine appreciation and more about signalling social status. This is the essence of perceptual elitism, a phenomenon that challenges us to reassess our understanding and appreciation of art in its purest form. The Joshua Bell subway experiment unravels the complex interplay of psychology, sociology and cultural dynamics in shaping art appreciation. It presents a compelling case study that challenges the way we perceive and engage with art. From the psychological perspective, this experiment underscores the power of social perception and cognitive dissonance. As we've seen, the commuter's preconceived notions and the context of a busy subway station during rush hour hindered their ability to recognize the world-class performance unfolding before them. Sociologically speaking, the bystander effect came into play, further deterring individuals from pausing to appreciate the music. The crowd's collective indifference, in turn, influenced individual behavior, creating a feedback loop of non-engagement. The concept of cultural capital and symbolic elitism also played a significant role in our societies, where cultural knowledge and appreciation often serve as badges of higher social status, the experiment highlights a superficial understanding of art. It shows us that we often prioritize the perception of sophistication over genuine appreciation. This brings us to the overarching concept of perceptual elitism. This term encapsulates the societal norms and biases that dictate the perceived value and appreciation of art. It asserts that art, more often than not, becomes a tool for signaling social status rather than a medium for genuine expression and connection. The implications of these findings are profound. They challenge us to reconsider our engagement with art and the societal constructs that influence it. They invite us to question whether we are truly appreciating art for its intrinsic value or merely using it as a means to project a certain image. In conclusion, the Joshua Bell subway experiment illuminates the intricate dynamics that shape our appreciation of art. It's a stark reminder of how psychology, sociology and cultural norms intertwine to influence our perceptions and behaviours. Join us in the comments to share your thoughts on perceptual elitism. Don't forget to subscribe for more explorations into the fascinating intersection of science, psychology and culture. Subscribe to the channel for more video and please give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this.